Good morning. Would you stand with me, please? Glad everyone is here with us and those that are joining us online that couldn't be here this morning. We hope you'll come and be back with us soon. We're going to start off with Holy Ground. Where we're gathered as a church family, the body of Christ, is holy ground. And God is present. So let's start our singing this morning. Recognize the presence of God, His Spirit that's here with us today. And I ask Him to come and be powerful in us. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and 
it's on. Okay, I'm surprised we have this many kids here with it being daylight savings. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised y'all all got yourself up and got dressed and got here with the children. Kudos to y'all. Uh, so the, the song that we're going to sing today is not as old as some of the songs that we've been singing, but it is a lot older than y'all are. It's a song from probably the 80s or 90s called Ain't No Rock. And yes, I am an English teacher, and I know you're not supposed to say ain't, but this time it doesn't count. You do get to say ain't on this song, okay, guys? So, um, and there are three verses to it, and I'm going to need everybody to help me with this um, since I don't have the wireless mic, and I've only got one hand here going to have to do the motions with one hand, so I need all of y'all to pitch in to help me on this. Um, so, oh, oh, Jean's going to take care of this for me, right? Okay, so we'll set this up so I can, will this work? Thank you. Okay, now i got two hands and I can do this, all right? So the three verses are, no rock, going to cry in my place. Okay, now the reason that we're saying these words, because that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Ain't no rock going to cry in my place. It's because in the Bible there's a place where the people are, uh, the religious authorities, the leaders are telling the people to be quiet. And Jesus says you can't tell them to be quiet. If they're going to praise God, they're going to praise God. And if they don't, the rocks will. Even the rocks will start singing. Have you all ever seen that happen? Nope, I haven't either. But that would be really cool if all of a sudden the rocks started singing to God. Wouldn't that be cool? But we don't have to do that because we're going to sing instead. So the rocks don't have to do it. So we're going to say, ain't no rock going to cry in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'll glorify the Son of God. Then the second verse we say, ain't no bird. No, yeah, it's ain't no rock going to cry in my place. Ain't no bird going to sing in my place. As long as that, because we're going to be birds on the second verse. Okay, you can either do like this, or you can do like this. And when we're the rocks, we're going like this. Y'all see me, people? Ain't no rock going to cry in my place. We'll do that in rhythm. Ain't no bird going to fly, fly in my place or sing in my place. That's what it is. And then ain't no branch. Ain't no tree going to wave its branches. So we'll have to do like this. Ain't no tree going to wave its branches. As long as I'm alive, I'll glorify the, his holy name. Okay, so everybody ready? We're going to start out with the Ain't No Rock motions here, okay? Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place Long as I'm alive, I'll glorify His holy name Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place Long as I'm alive, I'll glorify His holy name Well I'm alive, I'll glorify His holy name. Well, well, praise His holy name. Long as I'm alive, I'll glorify His holy name. Ain't no bird gonna sing in my place. Long as I'm alive, I'll glorify His holy name. Well, ain't no bird gonna sing in my place. Long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Well, well, praise His holy name. Long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Well, well, praise His holy name. Long as I'm alive, I glorify His holy name. Well, ain't no tree gonna wave its branches. I lift my hands to glorify this holy name. Well, ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify his holy name. Well, well, praise his holy name. Long as I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Well, I'm alive, I glorify his holy name. Ain't no rock. That's how you end it. You just go, ain't no rock. Okay, good job. Y'all have been great on that.
am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings and on Mount Ebal the curses. Good morning, everybody. Well, I want to remind you that there is a box at the back of the auditorium on the wall, and there has been an email that has gone out uh, for Shepherd nominations. I know several of you have already filled some out, but we have the entire month of March to nominate folks who you would follow, who you believe embody the characteristics, the lifestyle described uh, as a follower of Christ in the Bible. And we have a box back there you can place those in. Also, I want to read a letter to you. And while I read this, there's a number of pictures there, Chuck. And if you get to the end, just cycle back to the beginning while I read this letter. We had a senior banquet last Sunday night where our teens served our senior citizens. And I want to read you what um, this beautiful letter that Melinda and Richard wrote. And they don't know I'm going to read this letter this morning, but I hope they'll forgive me for it. All right, dear Brian, Ryan, Trey, Josh, and our Reedland youth, Richard and I want to express our appreciation and gratitude for the wonderful evening we had with some very exceptional youth. Our hearts were joyful and hopeful of the future of the church as we watched our Reedland youth attend to every detail of the night, serving us, the seniors of Reedland, with a smile. It was an honor for us to be able to watch these teenage boys and girls as they made sure everything was perfect for our meal and the evening. We want to commend all the parents, the teachers at Reedland Church, and others who have been instrumental in leading our youth to this point. They remind us that the future of Christ's church is in good hands. We were so impressed with the entire evening, from the greetings we received when we arrived, to the gracious gracious attention to our meal, to the end of the evening with the game show. Not only are our youth able to serve us a delicious meal, but they are all comedians as well. These kids gave us a five-star night that went far beyond our expectations. We also want to commend the inspiring job the youth did Sunday morning. There is no end to their talents, we have decided. The service Sunday morning was inspiring and encouraging. These youth have talents, yes, and they are not hiding them. Their hearts are filled with love for God and their neighbors that will keep the light of Christ burning bright for eternity. We know that this did not just happen, these sweet, good kids, but that their parents, grandparents, teachers, youth teachers, and leaders at Reedland, and hopefully the adults, even the seniors, have had a part in helping them along the way. They are the church's future. Brian, please share this with the youth and their leaders. Thank you and all the parents for such a lovely evening. We are grateful to be in the family of God at Reedland, and we will be happy to continue encouraging the future of the church, our youth, grow in wisdom, faith, and love. I just thought that was such a beautiful letter. I wanted to share that on behalf of not only Richard and Melinda, but all the folks who attended. We just heard wonderful things from people, and our kids did a great job. They're not perfect people, neither are we, but they do love the Lord. And uh, our leaders who who invested so much, and uh, Trey and Ryan and Josh and Leslie and Julia and Jenny and um, all the other people that are helping, Uh, with that uh, on a a weekly basis Uh, worked really hard with them uh, but it's easy to work with them when they are such good kids so we're grateful we're very very grateful I want to talk this morning a little bit about stage fright some of you all in this room can identify it is anybody here courageous enough to admit they have stage fright anybody okay yeah yeah in fact um the butterflies in the stomach the cracking voice the shaking hands the knocking knees the dry mouth Why? It's based on the thought that standing in front of a crowd might end up with you looking like a fool. Public speaking is the number one fear in America. Death is the number two fear. So if you run the logic, if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. 
It really doesn't matter who you are. I mean, it affects everybody in the right situation. Even the most polished performer caught at the wrong moment in the wrong situation can succumb to the fear of being in front of people. In fact, in a few moments, I'm going to show you a video of somebody you will recognize instantly who is gripped with terrible stage fright. And I'll tell you who it is. In September of 1965, the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show for the fourth and final time. They were old pros by this time, and they got on stage, and they performed I Feel Fine and Help and Ticket to Ride and a number of other hits. But they also planned to do a brand new song that day, a brand new song called Yesterday. But this would be different. The band had always performed together as a band, but the director on the Ed Sullivan Show said no. For this song, Paul is going to step out by himself with his guitar We're going to darken the stage, and he's going to perform alone. And he was told this about two minutes before he went on. So, you know, Paul calmed his nerves and thought, okay, he's never performed the song for anybody before. It's a brand new song. He's always performed with the band. He's never performed solo, but, you know, he's a professional. He can do this. And he was standing behind the curtain, about to step out, calming his nerves, when one of the stagehands said to him, are you frightened? And he said, no, I'm okay. And the stagehand said, well, you should be. There's 73 million people watching. <laughs> Let's show the video. It's after the PowerPoint, Chuck. I've seen that video before. Uh, I had the pleasure a couple years ago going to the Carson Center and seeing one of these Beatles, you know, revival shows perform this song. And they played that video on screen. Well, the guy who was portraying Paul McCartney did it on stage with every tick of the head and breath and movement exactly mirroring what was I was really impressive. It's very famous, very famous recording. But watching it now that you've heard the context, and by the way, that story I shared came from Paul McCartney himself in talking about that event. Watching it now, did you see the sweat? You see how profusely he was setting, he was terrified. He was absolutely terrified because of the comment that was made to him, realizing that on the other side of that camera were going to be 73 million people. I mean, he's one of the Fab Four, one of the Beatles, the heartthrobs of American teenagers everywhere, top of the charts, kings of pop culture. What does he have to be afraid of? Well, maybe... He remembers when Elvis went on that Sullivan show a decade earlier and the censors lost their minds and they dubbed him Elvis the pelvis. And he's thinking, what if I do something wrong? Or maybe he's worried about the fact that when the Beatles started out in Liverpool, they were booed off the stage almost every show. But whatever was going through his mind, he was profusely sweating in terror of what was in front of him. Alone, on stage, just him and a guitar, and 73 million people. I don't generally have stage fright, but I'm pretty sure I would in that situation. So I want you to think on some level of when you've been there. Oh, sure, you haven't been on stage in front of 73 million people, but when you have been terrified. Maybe it was stage fright. Maybe you were run out of gas in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night and you know I don't know what it was maybe you were in some scary place or when you were terrified of what the doctor was going to say think of that time when you were filled with fear filled with dread and all you could do was grit your teeth and step forward expecting you're going to get hit we know that feeling And I want us to connect that feeling this morning with what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying in chapter 12. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking.
They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was frightened at the sight, and he said, I am terrified and trembling. What the author is referencing here is the inauguration of the Old Covenant at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. God descended upon the mountain and it was engulfed in dark, menacing clouds with roars of thunder and flashes of lightning and trumpet blasts. And they had to surround the mountain with a a barrier marked out that if anyone came close to it, they would surely have to be stoned to death because they couldn't come into the presence of the Lord. And the mountain was engulfed with fire. And even... Even that was not the most terrifying thing. When God spoke from the mountain, it was so terrifying that they begged him to stop speaking. Now, I don't know what that mountain looked like. This is a lava field in front of a mountain here. I couldn't find the picture, but I remember that when Gatlinburg was on fire a few years ago, in the news, I saw a photo of one of the last cars that was able to get out of the road between Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge before the trees collapsed and blocked the road. And that road, if you've driven it, is kind of a tunnel of trees. And all of them were on fire. And this car is driving in the dark of night as fast as it can through the center of this tunnel of fire with sparks and smoke. It's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying terrifying sight and the people were terrified and the people standing before the mountain of God had crippling fear butterflies in their stomach cracking voices shaking hands knocking knees dry mouth falling back away from the mountain in the awesome and terrifying voice of God you ever be caught in a thunderstorm I mean I think we all have been in our cars and it's scary enough when you're driving down the highway and your wipers are going as fast as they can and you still can't see. And you just think, maybe there's an overpass I can stop under. And as soon as you get to one, there's four motorcycles stopped under there. And you get, so you end up pulling by the side of the road and there's lightning and, and it's, it's pretty scary. Now, I haven't been caught in a thunderstorm, not in a car, but plenty of people have. I know two people in my life I've known have been struck by lightning. What happens when you're out in the middle of a field, in the middle of nowhere, and flashes of lightning fill the sky and thunderclaps so close that you can feel the ground shake? You ever been in your house during a thunderstorm and the thunder is so loud that your house shakes? Your windows vibrate, you feel it in your floor? It's the sound of, what is it, 1.2 gigawatts? It's terrifying. Well, Martin Luther, the great reformer, started the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was going to be a lawyer. His dad wanted to be a lawyer. He went to school for law. He hated it. He started philosophy, tried to drop out of law, didn't want to do it. And then one day, he was in the middle of the country with his horse and buggy, and he got caught in an awful and terrifying thunderstorm. He ended up out of his buggy. I don't know if it flipped or what happened, but he was out, and he was laying on the ground, hunkering under a log, absolutely terrified as lightning was hitting trees around him and he brokered a deal with God. You ever been there? He said, God, if you get me out alive, I'll be a monk. And that's what he did. Promise a lot of things when you're terrified. This mountain covered in fire, flashes of lightning and thunder and the terrifying voice of God instilled the fear of the Lord in the people. And that's how the Old Covenant was initiated, with the fear of the Lord. The fear of His awesome, awesome power. The same people who saw Him send the plagues, the same people who saw Him split the Red Sea, that was nothing compared to what they saw at the mountain. Even when Moses was allowed to come up on the mountain and receive the Ten Commandments, when he came down, his face glowed, which is kind of cool, except that the people then were terrified of Moses, and they made him wear a veil because just the glowing of his face from being in the presence of God was terrifying. 
And then when the people made the mistake of saying, hey, Moses has been up there too long. We don't know that God might have killed him. We need to make a new God. And they made a golden calf. God sent plagues, and he sent the Levites throughout the camp to slaughter all those who were worshiping the idols. Even more terrifying. And this is how it began. This is how the Old Covenant began. With the almighty power of the God, the Lord of the universe, being displayed in such a way that people would shrink back in fear from the mountain. These kind of visions are repeated throughout the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, it says this. In chapter 6, it says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Or Ezekiel, who fell flat on his face when he saw the angels that looked like multi-faced beasts with wings and smoke and wheels and wheels inside of wheels, turning in different directions, flying around proclaiming that God was holy. And then above them... He saw the Lord who looked like he was made from precious stones uh, surrounded in rays of a brilliant and blinding light of many colors. Well, then there was Daniel, who in chapter 7 describes the Son of Man descending from the Lord. And he says, his clothing was as white as snow. And the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Tens of thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. This mountain, the one where God lives the one where god meets with his people the one where heaven touches earth is a terrifying mountain and the people who experience the presence of god this way left shuddering with the fear of the lord but the writer of hebrews doesn't stop there you know what the writer of hebrews says he says this is not our mountain. If your life experience with God has been coming to the mountain of fear and trembling, coming to the place where I am horrible and God is awesome and he wants to destroy me and I'm barely escaping his wrath and I'm terrified of him, you've been at the wrong mountain. You've been at the mountain of the old covenant. Now it's not a false mountain. It's not an untrue mountain. God is awesome. He is terrifying. He is holy. And we are nothing before him. But it's not our mountain. This is what the author of Hebrews goes on to say. But you, you, Christians, Believers in Jesus, those saved by his blood, those washed by the blood of the Lamb, those sitting here this morning in this church, in this place, 2,000 years later, to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Rather than a terrifying mountain 
of smoke and fire, lightning and thunder. This is Mount Zion, a beautiful mountain, a mountain upon which the new Jerusalem and the temple of the living God sits. A city of light and life and grace and forgiveness and worship. And unlike the mountain that you were barred from and there was a barrier to keep you from coming near it because if you did, you will surely die, this mountain you are invited to climb and ascend. And if you don't, all that's left out there is death because on this mountain is life. Rather than heaven and earth meeting at a rocky peak in a barren wilderness where Sinai was, we have come to a mountain covered with a holy city with thousands upon thousands of God's people. Rather than God's presence being obscured in clouds and closed to all but Moses, we have come to a mountain where the temple of God has been opened and the veil has been torn and the doors are cast open for all to enter by King Jesus. Rather than a mountain that instills the fear of death, we have come to a mountain that gives us new life through the blood of of Jesus. And this last verse, what a strange thing to say. You've come to a mountain that speaks of better testimony than the blood of Abel? What is that? Well, we talked about this a little in our Bible class this morning. Who was Abel? Think back. It was the first man ever murdered. Cain offered a sacrifice, Abel offered a sacrifice. God liked Abel's sacrifice. Who knows why? Cain's obviously didn't have his heart in it. And Cain got angry. And he killed Abel. And he buried Abel. And he thought he could bury beneath the ground what he had done. But Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. The word of Abel's blood was vengeance, justice, retribution. That was the word of Abel's blood. That was the word of the mountain. Vengeance, justice, retribution. God is holy and his wrath and his fire and his thunder and his presence and his fear should be upon you for your sin. But the blood sprinkled upon us on Mount Zion is the blood of Jesus. The blood that says, though I deserve justice, I show mercy. Though I deserve vengeance, I give love. Though I should have retribution, I instead offer redemption. A better word. The blood of Christ able to do what the blood of Abel couldn't. To make right the wrongs. To unbury the dead to extinguish the fires, to change lives. We read, Nan did a great job of reading a scripture about Mount Ebal and Mount Jerizim. When the Israelites entered the land, they were brought to two mountains. One was a mountain of blessing and one was a mountain of curses. And they said, if you follow God's law and you do all that I command you and you don't turn your back and you don't return to the gods of Egypt or turn to the gods of this land, you'll be like the people on Mount Gerizim. It's kind of a natural amphitheater. And half the people were there, half were on Ebo. I said, you'll be like these people. They will be blessed. And I'll protect you and the land will be abundant and I'll rid the land of wild beasts and your children will flourish. But if you don't keep the law, you'll be like the people on Mount Ebal. And I will send hail to destroy your crops and beasts to kill your animals. Your children will get sick and you'll starve. There's a great word picture. He said, who do you want to be? Which mountain do you want to live on? And the author of Hebrews is offering the same choice to us. He's saying, there is no plan B. God's plan was always Jesus. That old law, those priests, the temple, all of that stuff was only a shadow to get us to begin to understand what Jesus would do when he came. He'd be greater than the temple. He'd be greater than the priests. He would embody the Sabbath. 
You'll be given the highest name on heaven and earth, the Son of God. But you don't have to accept him. If you want to go back to the temple, the priests and the animal sacrifices, never truly be forgiven, just get your sin shoved off to next year, deal with it later. Never truly be transformed. Stay distant from God. Let some priest mediate between you and God. If that's what you want to do, you can do. But understand that that mountain is on fire. That mountain is death. That mountain is terror and fear. And Christ came to destroy that mountain and in its place build a city of God's people where we can be with God made new, reborn, redeemed, forgiven with thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly having every need met before God. So the same choice that they had is the choice that we have. Which mountain do you want? Do you, do you really want to live the life where Life isn't centered on Jesus, it's centered on religion. Make sure the right name's over the door, make sure we worship the right way, make sure I show up and at least stay till communion. That always got me when I was growing up. People would come into church, we did communion the same time every Sunday, they'd come in, they'd stay till communion, and then they'd leave. Check the box. You can have that, but that mountain is nothing but fire and death and terror and fear. Or you can come to the city of the living God. Be part of real community. And you'll fall on your face. And you'll make mistakes. And you'll walk down paths you never thought you would walk down. And Jesus Christ and your brothers and sisters will pick you up and put their arms around you. They won't throw you out of the city. Which mountain do you want to be on? Funny thing about the story about uh, the Beatles is uh, due to scheduling, that actually wasn't a live performance. It was taped August 14th. It didn't air until September 12th, almost a month later. As I told you, that story came directly from Paul McCartney. I heard a recording of him telling that story. He knew when he stepped on the stage that it would be a month until that would be played. He wasn't afraid that I'm going to be on live TV right now and I'm going to mess this up. He knew I'm recording something that will be on live TV in a month. The way recording worked, the way editing worked then, they recorded the whole show in a shot. There was no retakes, there was no going back. So it was just like being on live TV, except he had a month to worry about it. He had a month where they were going on tour and doing publicity stops to be terrified, because guess what? Because of the way that it worked then, he didn't get to see the tape. He had no idea. He didn't know he'd been sweating bullets. He didn't know if he did good or bad. He didn't know if he was off key, out of tune. He had no idea. All he could do was get, I think I did okay. How did it sound to you guys? Yeah, it sounded all right. He didn't know how it came across, and he wouldn't until it aired on the Ed Sullivan Show for 73 million people. He had a month. A month. We've come to a mountain of love and forgiveness, a mountain of grace. But we can't just move in and live there yet. And I want to. We're halfway there, halfway here. We're citizens of heaven, but citizens of earth. Both and, seeing things as if through a veil. And in that intermeaning time, I worry. I look at a mountain of love and grace, and I worry that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a mountain of fire. Maybe I won't be allowed in. Maybe I should just sit here at the bottom of the mountain and say, I'm content to be close, but I can't join. I'm really not worthy. Maybe you've been there too. It's pretty easy to sit there and wait for a month or a year or a lifetime 
quaking in fear that one day God's going to show a film strip of your life, of you sweating bullets, of you being off key, and everybody's going to laugh at you. And then they're going to say, thanks but no thanks. Get off my mountain. So the question becomes, do we trust? Do we trust God's word? That what we hope for, what we're waiting for, really is a better mountain? Do we trust enough to stick through the hardest things that we can ever go through, clinging to Jesus, because we know that we are welcome on that mountain? Get up! Run up that mountain. Be embraced by God. Trust him. And this is how the chapter ends. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 ends saying, Our God is a consuming fire. And if I was his editor, I would have said, Bad line, no, back up. You're confusing the whole thing. You just said fire is bad. You just said the mountain of fire is terrible. And now you're ending the chapter by saying God's a consuming fire. That sounds like you're telling everybody, Choose God, choose Jesus, choose grace. But by the way, he's still going to burn you up. But he is. He's going to consume you, not to destroy you, but to remake you, to purify you, to consume you so completely that what's left is all his. It's a different kind of fire. It's a fire on the altar of self-sacrifice as we lay ourselves before God and say, I trust you, I'm all yours, and he consumes us completely and remakes us in his image and gives us a home on this beautiful mountain. So which mountain do you want? Let's stand and sing.
pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to be able to come to you in prayer to express our concerns, to show our our love and our gratitude um, to you for everything that you have done for us, Father, that we can approach your throne uh, with confidence, Father, and, and not in a confidence uh, for anything that that we have done, but, Father, to, for who you are and, and for what you have done. Father, I pray that you will be with uh, our shepherds, Brian, and those making the decision uh, as we add uh, shepherds to our church family, I pray that you will give them the patience and, and the wisdom that they need and that they would make the right decision concerning uh, our shepherds for, to lead us in, in this church family. Father, thank you uh, for loving us, for giving us Jesus, for giving us your spirit. We pray that your spirit will, will guide us and in everything that we do, Father. Father, we know that we fall short and pray that you'll forgive us when we do. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Recently, as we passed the vineyard in southern Illinois, uh, our oldest son, Ryson, told us that grapevines need stress and drought to produce better fruit. He'd been studying grape production, and he said, struggling wine, vines produce better wines, quote unquote. Grapes are grown on hillsides, so they don't get too much water. They have to send their roots deep in order to produce sweeter, more interesting grapes. If the vines are not stressed or don't have to work for water, they produce just shoots and leaves or maybe more fruit, but it's bland, tasteless fruit. We were so surprised to learn this. If you produce, pr provide a lush environment for grapes with lots of fertilizer and water, they're going to be blah. But if you make the vine struggle and work, they will be great. I immediately thought of the spiritual applications for us as Christians. Jesus calls himself the vine in John 15. And what better vine has there ever been than Jesus? And think how hard his life was. We often remember his horrendous tortured death when we take the Lord's Supper. But Jesus also struggled and suffered throughout his life. Just imagine what it would be like to have lived all your life, all your existence, I don't know what you call it, Jesus' existence, in heaven with God in close fellowship with him in perfection and then have to leave all of that for this world with its pain and its work and it's dust and sweat and exhaustion and tears. What a sacrifice even without the cross, but what a strong and perfect vine that struggle produced in Jesus. And that's what he wants for us. Jesus calls us branches. He told us life would be hard. In John 16, 33, he says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So he fully expects us to struggle. As he said, you will have trouble. I can't say that this is a comforting thought, but it's an encouraging thought. There's purpose to the struggle and the stress. Jesus is producing quality grapes or disciples. He wants us to be sweeter or better flavored and to be interesting and complex. As we take this bread and fruit of the vine, we remember Jesus' hard life and death. But we rejoice at the sweetest of wines that it produced for us, redemption and resurrection. And we can take heart at the struggles 
and the hard things that we deal with in this life, knowing that it is producing something fruitful in us. Remember, struggling vines produce better wines. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for the struggle that you allowed Jesus to have here in his life on this earth and in his death. And we're so grateful for the strong vine that it produced and the wonderful wine that it created for our redemption, his resurrection and our resurrection. As we remember this right now, I pray that you help us to take heart at all the hard things that we have to struggle through also to remember that Jesus suffered first and he suffers along with us and to know that this brings about the fruit that you want in us. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. All that you've done, I will thank you for all that you're going to do, for all that you promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. And I thank you, thank you, And I thank you, thank you, and I thank you. Thank you.